Hello and welcome to Methodist at Service Together for Sunday the 17th of January. My name is the Reverend Brian Yardy and I'm so pleased you can join us for worship today. As usual, all of the words will appear on the screen, but you might also like to follow on the service sheet which was sent out via post and email to various people. Now I'm conscious that we're in the middle of lockdown and we can't physically be together. But we know that we are joined in heart and mind by Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And also this week is the week of prayer for Christian unity. So I would like us to focus our thoughts this week on that subject of Christian unity. And whatever you are feeling today, I pray that something that you hear will be of comfort and encouragement and a blessing to your life. So to begin with, we have our call to worship and we hear the words of Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. Amen. Thank you. 
Loving God, we thank you that you call us together as part of the great family of your people. We praise you for the common bond you have given us in Jesus, the fact that we gather as friends in fellowship with you and one another, and as part of the great company of your people in every country, time and place. We praise you that through Jesus Christ, we have become a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, your own people, called to proclaim your mighty acts in leading us out of darkness into light. You have called us to be the people of God, chosen and precious to you, and we have received your mercy in all its wonder. Loving God, we praise you for your awesome love, so great that while we were yet sinners, you gave your Son for us. We praise you for your limitless patience, always forgiving despite our failure to serve you as we should. We praise you for your constant care, watching over us as a father watches over his children. So, loving God, as we worship today as your people, may we be encouraged through being joined by your Spirit, with you and with one another. So, may your family, your church in every place, grow and flourish to the glory of your name. Amen. Our Epistle reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 14 to 27. And so the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Now if the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, 
those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable and the parts that we think are less honourable we treat with special honour and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together giving greater honour to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. Amen. John 17, verses 20 to 26. Jesus prays for all believers. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me, and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, and to see my glory, the glory you have given me, because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me, I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Amen. Several parts of the body tried to determine who would be boss. The brain said, since I already coordinate every function of the body, I am the logical choice to be boss. The heart objected, saying, without my pumping blood throughout the body, none would be able to function, so I should be boss. The eyes said, without us, the body would not know where it was going. We should be boss. The mouth said, I speak for the body. I should be boss. And one by one, each member of the body gave reasons as to why they should be boss. Finally, the neck spoke up and said that he should be boss. You, said the brain, why you? You don't do anything to begin with. Yeah, said the heart. We wouldn't even miss you if you weren't here. Now this made the neck feel very mad and he became tense. His muscles knotted up and he began to exert excruciating pain. So intense was the pain that the brain couldn't think. The eyes became blurry and the heart began to work so hard that it became tired and began to skip a beat every, every now and then. And after a week of this, all the parts of the body agreed that the neck could be boss. And the moral of this story, you don't have to be a brain or have a heart to be a boss. All you have to do is be a pain in the neck. Or alternatively, the moral could be, it only takes one pain in the neck to disrupt 
the unity of the whole. How true. But seriously, today we focus our thoughts on the subject of Christian unity and what that means for us. The readings today have been uh, focusing on that theme of unity. But I would like to uh, focus our attention on the passage from John's Gospel, chapter 17. So picture the scene for a moment. Jesus and his disciples are in the upper room, sharing their last meal together. He has spent a, a considerable amount of time instructing the disciples in preparation for his death and their future ministries in God's kingdom. So Jesus is really poised between the conclusion of his earthly task and the glory awaiting him in th at the Father's side. And like a mountaineer gazing out uh, from the pinnacle across the expanding vista, as range succeeds range into the distant horizon, so Jesus gazes out across the rolling centuries. And as he does so, Jesus is in prayer. He prays what could possibly be described as the greatest prayer ever prayed on earth, and certainly the profoundest prayer ever recorded in scripture. Through it, he beholds and embraces the harvest of the ages. The future, the future church of the Redeemer, gathered from, from every nation, people, language and tribe. Jesus is praying for unity. He is praying for the church. He is actually praying for us. For you and for me today. You see, by showing Jesus at prayer for the future church, John the Evangelist invites us also, as today's readers of his gospel, to apply this prayer to a church that often struggles to unite. If you like, there is a kind of fusion that takes place between the times of Jesus, John writing the gospel, and our present day ecumenical situation. Indeed, this prayer of Jesus actually contains the charter of the ecumenical movement that began in the early 20th century with its slogan, that they all may be one. But you know, I'm sure that John didn't have such modern day church predicaments in mind when he wrote this bit of his gospel. Rather, he was operating at a much uh, less churchy level, but a deeper level. What he did write certainly has implications of how we should relate to each other and the world outside the church today for it speaks profoundly about our oneness in spiritual unity that embraces all humanity if you like it's about being connected being connected to each other in some way or other but how does all this work how can we be connected? What exactly is this dynamic source of oneness which spreads to enfold all humanity? Well, as Jesus prays, all is revealed. The key is the unity or relationship between the Father and the Son. If you recall, this was how John began his gospel in the first place, celebrating the timeless unity between the Word 
and God. For the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The eternal Logos, Jesus, the Word at the breath of creation, Father and Son as one from the very beginning. You see, throughout John's Gospel, Jesus has stressed that he and the Father are one. And now at the end, Jesus again insists on this same timeless unity. As you are in me and I am in you. But this time as the centre of a unity which encompasses all believers. May they be one. We become one, joined together by the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Very Trinitarian. This surely is a most profound mystery. For if it is true, then the life that we share together as Christians is nothing less than a sharing in sharing in the life of the Godhead, the Trinity. It is a special kind of unity, which is not merely reflecting, uh, but not really reflects, but actually participates in the unity of God. In other words, the unity of love that binds the Son to the Father is that same unity that binds us together too. That is what Jesus said. So then in practical terms, the challenge of Jesus' prayer is inescapable. Through our unity with the Godhead, Father, Son and Spirit, we are called to, to promote a positive response to the church and to the world in working together in its mission and unity. In reality, the churches are already one in God. But we need to allow that divine unity to find expression in the local church and between various uh, traditions and denominations. But in wider terms, certainly, unity is something for which all Christians should be deeply concerned and strive for. And when we are faced uh, with the varied differences and tensions displayed amongst church traditions, we might draw some encouragement from Jesus' prayer. You see, no matter how hard we struggle with our differences, we can already enter into the deepest unity of all, drawn by the Holy Spirit of love into that timeless unity of Father and the Son, the eternal Trinity, which is the deepest and most profound unity of all. And for me, this foundation stone, the foundation stone on which the church can build unity, is that relationship within the Trinity. And if we see things through the lens of the Trinity, then our vision of unity cannot then be translated as sameness or uniformity. We are not all the same. Apart from anything, uh, uniformity is boring monotony. And you know, history tells us that whenever the church has tried to impose religious uniformity, it's not only failed, but it has also left deep scars in many lives as well. No, there has to be another way to be connected to each other. Unity cannot be about uniformity or sameness, especially if we see, see things through the lens of the Trinity. For in the Trinity, we have a rather different model 
that allows us to acknowledge, us, acknowledge our differences at the same time as functioning and working together. This is because in the Trinity we see most profoundly the tensions of both unity and diversity in complete harmony. And I suppose if we wanted a, a, a simple illustration for this, we could picture an orchestra or perhaps a, a choir. Each instrument or voice makes a different sound. Some are high notes, some are low, some with harsh tones and others with soft tones. But working together they produce a wonderful rich harmony and the success of all this depends on many things but but the crucial thing is that each musician or singer must keep their eyes on the conductor who keeps everything together now it's easy to see that without the variety of notes played together there would be no harmonies and without a conductor to hold things together, things would very easily fall apart. And the same could be said for the Church of Christ. Even though we might have a variety of traditions and different views and ways of seeing things, there is actually much that we have in common if we just remain open to each other, listen out for the harmonies, so to speak. Besides our diversity, those differences can actually be a strength, producing rich harmonies that keep and keep our eyes fixed on the conductor, our Heavenly Father. All this, in turn, should encourage us to display mutual love for one another as we seek to promote true spiritual unity. Then we will be close enough to, uh, to one another and caring enough to feel each other's pain and to feel each other's delight too. Well, our thoughts are coming to a close. But to focus our response, I would like to draw inspiration from the Methodist tradition. One of John Wesley's 44 sermons is entitled The Catholic Spirit. And in this sermon, uh, John Wesley recognises that there are many things which both divide and unite Christians. But he stresses that what Christians have in common is more important than what divides them. And amazingly, he even says that complete agreement is not absolutely essential between all Christians. And so with our many differences in mind, Wesley encourages this response towards each other. He says this, don't be critical or judgmental. Love each other. Commend each other to God in prayer and encourage and assist each other to love and do good works. But above everything else, offer a universal hand of love to all. Now I think that John Wesley got it right on this occasion. But his brother Charles expresses the same thing uh, rather more, more poetically in one of his hymns that we're going to sing in just a moment. All praise to our redeeming Lord. And the words of verse 2 are an encouragement for us today. He bids us build each other up and gathered into one 
to our high calling's glorious hope, we hand in hand go on. Amen. of intercession. Let's pray. Father God, we praise and thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ, our brother, for his life of teaching and healing, and for his death and rising again, that we might see your likeness in him and trust you with our lives. We all belong to you, loving God, but too often we forget when we look at other Christians whose beliefs or worship differs from ours, we often see only what is different rather than the family resemblance. Forgive us and open us up to your spirit that becoming one in you, we may be the answer to Christ's prayer. We pray for all church leaders as they talk and pray and work together discovering new ways of being one. And we bring before you now the churches of our own communities. May you show us how we can best serve this present age as the united people of God. We also pray for the church throughout the world, divided by geography, custom and history, challenged by different needs and opportunities but united by our desire to worship you, to work and pray for your kingdom. Make us one, Lord, that the world may say, see how these Christians love one another. Make us one, Lord, that the world may see its hope of salvation in Jesus Christ. Amen. And together we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
Well, as we come to our closing prayer of blessing, I would like to thank you for being with us today. And I hope that you have enjoyed our time of worship together. And I pray that something you have heard will be a blessing to you in the coming week. And so let us pray. God of all, through the gift of your Holy Spirit, you have united your people in the confession of your name. Lead us by the same Spirit to show to the whole earth one mind in faith and one faith for justice. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.